Hmm. So Dustin, huh? Good old Dusty. <laughs> Dustin Wilson, my friend, and we're very excited to be having this fine gentleman on the show. Uh, some of you may have heard of him. Um, he's in a series of films about the wine industry called Saab. Hey, guys. What's up, dude? How's it going? Come on in. Hey, hey. How's it going? Well, how are you? Good. Welcome to Verve Wine, guys. Good, Good to have you Excited here. To be here. Yeah, awesome, awesome. Basically, we've got the store kind of split into a couple of sections here. Uh, behind you, this is kind of like our uh, value price stuff. Huge Chenin Blanc fan. I uh, love Cab Franc, so this is like a really fun little section here. This this whole wall is, is burgundy. We've kind of got it organized by uh, Piedmont into like Friuli and Northern Italy into Tuscany and then into like some other places. I think within the hospitality industry, I think there are a lot of people that look up to him in terms of mapping out their own future. Mm -hmm. And I want to make oh, sure yeah. that, that we ask those questions that, that that extract those gems. So we want to talk more entrepreneurship, right? I mean, it seems that's yeah, me. it's what everybody wants to talk to Dustin about is yeah, wine. Yeah. You know, and I'm sure so many of his skills as a business owner and transitioning from being a sommelier into being a wine merchant are also interesting and relevant to what other business people are doing in the space. So what the hell is the difference between a song and a master song? Uh, it's a great question. Um, so a sommelier or psalm is, is, in my mind anyway, and a lot of people will argue with this, is, um, is a position in a restaurant setting specifically. So it's a sommelier is a person that's working the floor of a restaurant that comes and helps you when you want to buy a bottle of wine in a restaurant. A master sommelier is a person that has gone through this process of, of getting accredited uh, by going through the Court of Master Sommelier's organization and have passed through the levels of tests in order to be able to call themselves a master of some day. So for me, I make the distinction of one's a, a position, one's a job, and one is a credential. Okay. So what's the debate? You said yeah, the think, of, think of it like a, like a mixologist or a bartender. You know, when they're, when they're bartending in, in the bar, uh, they're behind the bar mixing cocktails, like that's, that's their craft. That's, then they're, they're, they consider themselves a mixologist at that point. But then if they go off and start working for a spirit brand, are they still a mixologist? Mm. You know what I mean? Mm. Probably not, the right? Is Depends awful. on how much you want to how how much you want to delineate that. Like in my mind, no, they're not a mixologist anymore. They're a salesperson. People thought you were crazy for leaving EMP, like leaving the best job in the industry to do your own thing. What are what are some of the sacrifice and the biggest risks that you've made making the transition? Uh a, you have to like not really give a shit at all about what people think because yeah. like if, if I worried about what everybody's perception of me was, I would have never left TMP. If my goal was to always just look like, you know, the man in the industry or something, why would I ever leave there? I think I left TMP in like May of 2015 and we didn't launch Verve until December of 2016. So it was like a solid year and a half uh, before we actually got going. and. Um, you know, I had to work some odd end jobs and like just kind of like scrape together some cash here and there in between, and um, it was scary because you know, like I see the funds I would saved up some cash, and if you see that like slowly dwindling away, and you're like, oh man, this is not good. <laughs> you know, I could have started this and I could have floundered really quickly, and then I'd be walking back into the wine industry with my tail between my legs, you know, like looking for a job. You know, and that's a risk that you take. So we're hearing that you are a master sommelier. Yes. And when you were working at 11 Madison Park, you were also a sommelier. Correct. But then you became something else. Yes. Can you tell us the story of that transition from going from 11 Madison Park to what you are now as the, one sure. of the proprietors of Verve Wine? It's funny because when I was leaving the restaurant, or when I did leave the restaurant, and before Verve actually got started, um, everybody was like, what's wrong with this guy? <laughs> like, he's crazy. You know, because EMP, the wine director role at 11 Madison Park is maybe one of the greatest, if not the best, wine director jobs in the country. You know, one of the best in the world. Like, why would anybody in their right mind leave that role? 
I knew EMP for me was always a stepping stone. It was never going to be the end-all be-all. I, you know, I, I wanted to open a restaurant. I wanted to start a business for as long as I can remember. I think when I was like even 13 years old, I was like running around the neighborhood like mowing lawns, you know, to try to make cash. My path was always, I didn't know what I, exactly I wanted to do necessarily. This is like obviously before I was getting into wine, but I always knew that I wanted to have something of my own. My first sommelier job was with a guy named Bobby Stuckey, who's also a master sommelier. He, he owns a restaurant in Boulder, Colorado called Frosca. And I remember when I started there, uh, he, was, he used to be the wine director at the French Laundry back in like the French Laundry's heyday. And I saw what being the, the guy at the French Laundry did for Frosca. Mm. It like brought it so much attention right out of the gates. It, um, the guests that were there, you know, had they had some connection to the French Laundry in Boulder, and they were just so excited and so jazzed by that. And um, it, I remember thinking then, I was like, all right, before I go off and do my thing, I gotta go work somewhere awesome. Like, really, really great. So that was the goal for a chunk of time. But then I remember my first day, walk, about to walking in, into EMP, I was like, all right, this is gonna be like my last restaurant job. Launching your business sounds like was hard work. Mm -hmm. it took you a little bit longer maybe than you had expected yeah. going into it. Um, but look, by the looks of it, it was completely worth it. And there's a reason why when you walk into your shop, it feels special and boutique and different than other wine stores. And so really, like, what is the vision of bourbon? What is bourbon? What is the story behind, like, the why behind why you took all those risks? It's really easy to just have good wine on the shelf. That's not difficult. You know, what's difficult and what makes us better, I think, and what I've always strived for is when people walk in, they feel differently. We're all trying to meet our consumers wherever they are yes. in their kind of journey. But it's right? tough, their right? Wine journey, sometimes, their like, journey, meet you know, them the, the argument sometimes is like you're dumbing stuff down when, you know, these are really high quality wines. And it's like, yeah, yeah I think some, some wines, sure, you know. But at the same time, the more we talk about that as an industry, and this is kind of where I get on my soapbox a little bit, the more we talk like that, the more we're alienating people. As an African-American kind of leader in the community, in the entrepreneurship community, I feel like part of my responsibility is to pay it forward and kind of sh shed light on how you do what you do. Do, do the master psalms, such, to such a small group, feel like they need to figure out a way or do they figure out ways together? Or by themselves independently to move the industry forward mm -hmm. since the industry seems so fragmented? Yes. So, you know, I, I can get really geeky and nitty gritty about, about wine just like anyone else, but I wanna, I wanna create environments where a larger group of people who maybe have an interest in wine but have felt a little intimidated to get into it feel safe, feel comfortable, and can come in and start to grow and learn and, and continue to build that community. To that point, you know, we're not curing cancer. Totally. You know, I think there's a moment where you have to stop and be like, it's it's grape juice. Right. Or, it, you know, it's it's the perfect blend of, of, of lime juice and sugar and orange essence or whatever. You know, it's like, we can't take ourselves that seriously Correct. because we're, we're, we're making things and we're selling things that are supposed to be, supposed be enjoyable. To be yeah. enjoyable, to make the end of your day that much more special or memorable. Right. Or Right. <laughs> Do you want to talk about this this yeah, bottle for yeah. a second as an example? You know, I, but I think it really embodies a lot of what we do here and kind of what we're all about. Yeah. Um, so this is a, a winery from Spain uh, called Commando G. Fairly young producer. They've been around for a few years. Um, they're located just outside of Madrid, uh, about 45 minutes west of Madrid. And uh, in this area called Rosas is like the, the name of the town here. It's a very handcrafted wine. They don't make a lot of this stuff. Um, it's very expressive of its place, of its sense of place. Um, they, they only use Grenache, by the way. That's the grape that they use um, exclusively. So that's all of their wines are only Grenache and just come from different places or different elevation levels and whatnot, or different ages of vine. So that's kind of how they separate things out. The label's really fun. It's got this quirky little boot on the front. It's uh, It's got a funky name to it. It's only 30 bucks. Yeah. You know, it's super accessible. It's not, that's not a cheap bottle of wine. You know, I think the average price that people pay for a bottle of wine these days nationally is like 13 or 14 dollars, you know, so it's more expensive than that. But 30 dollars is also not expensive. When you look at your life from a 13 year old mowing lawns 
to a teenager fantasizing about being a ski bum with your own restaurant and bar, uh, to ending up in Psalm and taking this path to become a master sommelier. Is opportunity in your mind something that you take or something that you make? Uh, awesome question. Um, and I think it's both. It's definitely both. I, I, I fully recognize that I've worked really hard in my career and I've kind of pushed in certain ways and you know wherever I was located I always wanted to to perform really well and um, I had no problem working longer hours or sacrificing my time or um, you know doing whatever had to be done to, to kind of rise and shine um, amongst my the, the people around me certainly some of the things that I've been able to do with my career with my my life um, have just been kind of like stroke of luck was in the right place at the right time I happened to be in the room when the idea for some like well, kind of came to be and I just got like randomly invited to join into this thing and I was like oh okay sure yeah no biggie my mom put in my head when I was young it was like luck is when opportunity meets preparation right so you always try to be as prepared as, as humanly possible um, and, and then recognize when those, those lucky opportunities come your way. And,